It is July 28th, 2008. My name is David Ulbrich. I am in Van Wert, Ohio to interview Major, Major James Jones as part of the Cantini First Division Oral History Project. Mr. Jones, can you please spell your last name? J-O-N-E-S. Thank you. When and where were you born? I was born July 26, 1959 in Port Huron, Michigan. And what was it like growing up in Michigan? Um, I don't have a lot of memories of Michigan. We, uh, my dad was a, a tool and die maker and he moved around a lot. We moved down to Ohio when I was seven, so I mainly have you know, memories of Ohio growing up. And what part of Ohio were you living in? Van Wert. Van Wert. And so what were your memories of Van Wert? Like? Um, pretty much the same as now. It's a uh, hot dusty windy summers and cold wintry snowy we uh, winters all right <clears throat> how and why did you enter the United States military um, I started um, college at Bowling Green Uni State University back in 1979 two years after I graduated uh, high school um, and I Went through college uh, basically on student loans until uh, President Reagan came in and cut back the student loan program. Um, and then I found myself without money. And uh, the military seemed to be a good place to get funded for college. So I enlisted in 1982 and went on uh, into basic training in 1983. And uh, where did you do your basic? I did basic training at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Had you ever been out of state like that? Have you ever had you ever been at South and and seen the different environment there? No, um, it it was uh, pretty surprising uh, for my first experience uh, being in South Carolina in in January of 1983. It was a lot colder than I thought it would be down south. A lot of frost. Uh, we never had snow, but it was it was in the 20s and 30s down there. So. Uh, what are some of the things you learned or took away from uh, basic training? Well, uh, that was my first introduction into, um, I guess, uh, meeting people from large urban areas and having to interact with those kind of people, um, and also from people from uh, poorer rural areas. Um, so it was kind of a mix, uh, a, a real melting pot of, of people thrown together and, and supposedly to come together to build a team. Um, but it was, it was a unique experience, very unique. What are some of the more memorable episodes uh, at boot camp? Um, I would say probably the road marches out to the rifle range um, because as nice as it sounds, they're never at an easy pace. You're either double timing or you're, you're uh, marching rather quickly. Um, and I, I remember I was fortunate enough to um, get a, an extra duty while I was in basic training and that was to be a truck driver. Um, I got to drive the chow truck, which meant I never had to pull KP. So that was kind of like one of the, uh, the benefits, I guess. But, uh, and I got to, got to drive back and forth to the ranges. And how far was that, that, that march out to the range? Oh, it seemed like forever. Um, it was probably two, three miles, but it just seemed like a long ways. Any other episodes or... Uh, memorable sort of experiences in boot camp? Um, not really. Uh, I just remember never being able to really finish a meal because by the time you sat down you were already supposed to have finished your meal and I can always remember the drill sergeants coming in saying you ain't got time to be conversating so you can chew it on the way out. What was a, uh, if there was a typical day at, at boot camp, what was the typical day like? Wow. Um, it was dark when we woke up. Um, and then, I mean, it was pandemonium trying to get your bunk made to Army standards, get dressed, make sure you had all your gear, 
um, with you that you're supposed to have for the day and make it to formation on time. And then once you made it to formation, um, you did whatever you know the drill sergeants had on the training schedule for you, and then you went to eat, and you went back more training. Um, and we did a lot of training in the uh, company area outside the barracks. There was a large area where we did either calisthenics or a PT, or we did first aid training or you know, basic soldier skills. And uh, the day continued, usually get an MRE for lunch, um, continued on with training until dark, and then you had a little time for uh, personal um, time, letters, showers, shining boots, and uh, keeping your uniforms up. And then, uh, uh, when was lights out? I couldn't tell you a specific time, I just know it was, uh, it was not as late as you'd think. I'd think it was probably maybe 9 o'clock. Um, and then, of course, you, you never really got a full night's sleep because you always had fire guard duty or, or some other um, CQ runner or something. Okay. About how long was, was boot camp? Was it 12 weeks or 9 weeks, or do you recall? I think it was 9 weeks when I went through in 83. And then uh, where did you do your advanced training? Um, I went to Fort Rucker, Alabama for um, to become a 93 Juliet, which was a air traffic controller radar operator. And they'd split out the tower operator and the radar operator at the time. All right. How did you did you pick that, or were you, did you score well on tests, or how did you how did you get into that? MLS. Well, you got to remember back in the uh, early 80s, uh, President Reagan um, fired a bunch of striking air traffic controllers. So there was a big push on through the military to fill those slots, and a lot of people were leaving the military to go work for the FAA. So they were short in those MOSs. And um, I had scored well enough on my ASVAB test that basically I could take any job uh, MOS in the military. And there was, a, I think, a $4,000 bonus with that uh, training once, once you completed it. So that was a good incentive. As fab, I, 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 for the benefit of people who are watching, I'll occasionally ask you to explain acronyms. Uh, As fab is the um, Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Tests. It's basically uh, it tests... Uh, different skill levels um, and I can't remember what those are at this time but that's what everybody is kind of pegged against okay um, how long was this training uh, to become an air traffic controller slash radar operator oh, let's see I got there in March um, I would say it's probably 18 or 19 weeks because it was pretty intense um, and uh, the washout rate was pretty high on it because it, it was, um, if you had a radar and your radar went out, you had to know manual procedures. For, and I mean, it basically mirrored the FAA um, training. But um, yeah, it, was, it was very long. Mine was longer because I was involved in an accident over uh, Memorial Day weekend, so I kind of got recycled a little bit. But. So uh, were, was it a 12-hour day kind of thing with lots of... Uh, intense sort of uh, pressure in terms of focusing on the screens and that and that sort of thing. What what when you say intense, what do you mean? Um, it was a lot of memorization. Um, you, as air traffic controllers, you can't go to a reference book all the time uh, because you know your situation could dictate an emergency. You have to know emergency procedures uh, in an instant. And um, there's approach plates for different airports. You have to know um, all the intersections within your area. I mean, there's just a, a, a plethora of, of uh, things you have to know. And it, it's kind of funny. It, uh, the day, days were actually pretty short. You did PT um, at the normal time, and then, you know, chow, and then you were bussed off to your classes. Um, and then basically you got out four or five in the afternoon and the rest of the evening was yours to to study or do whatever um, 
and I remember waking up in the middle of the night and just hearing uh, people who were in the, the last parts of the class. Um, they would be talking in their sleep and they'd be re reciting emergency procedures. That's how much you really had to study. Um, it was it was really interesting. In terms of washout rates, um, when you say high washout rates, how high or do you have any any sort of notion or uh, of what those would be? Um, I, I think it was at least a quarter of all the kids that went through there uh, washed out and then they became that uh, what they were um, fuel um, operators work on the tankers. That was an incentive not to wash out so you didn't become one of the, the POL specialists. And if you washed out, you didn't get your bonus. Do you think that you're being maybe a little older and having been to college, do you think that that was a benefit to you during the, you know, the studying time and that? Um, I'd like to think it was. Um, I, it, the realization of, of having been not able to um, complete my, my education kind of gave me a little bit of a drive to to complete this so I could get the, the GI Bill so I could complete college. So uh, following training, you said you went in March to the uh, ATC training, uh, air traffic controller training. It was, I said, 18, 19 weeks? Yeah, I, I know. I, I think I graduated in August. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that that's about right. Yeah. Um, and then um, was actually lucky that um, I was able to go in an overseas assignment, but um, I went to a Schofield Barracks assigned to the 25th Infantry. That's in uh, uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, right. Wow, that's really seeing the world then, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what was... Uh, what was that experience like with the 25th uh, ID, 25th ID? Well, we were um, a small forward platoon um, whose company headquarters was in Fort Lewis, Washington. Our battalion was in Fort Hood, um, and we supported the 25th uh, on their helicopter training, basically. The, the downside to being with the 25th at that time was our radar was inoperative and I had to go back for maintenance and um, the entire three years I was over there I never saw radar once. So we did a lot of manual flight following for the division um, and there were a few individuals who were lucky enough to get cross training with the Navy to use their radar down at Barber's Point. But um, it was um, I mean, it was it was Hawaii. You know, I was young, single, and it was it was a good time. In terms of doing this uh, manual tracking, or can, can you explain a little more about what what went into that? Um, well, basically, it's uh, when an aircraft enters your um, control zone. Basically, we we followed them on a map, and there were set routes that the pilots knew that we knew, and they would call in every. 15 minutes and they would uh, tell us their location within the routes and then we would just you know if they didn't answer within 15 minutes we'd call and to, if, to find out if there was an issue or if they just forgot to report so basically we're just kind of babysitting those guys when they're out flying and were these did you say helicopters with also fixed wing aircraft or um, are all traffic going in and out no it was just helicopters which were a lot easier because they don't Go quite as fast as a fixed wing. So, right. What was unit morale like, or can you explain? Uh, give me an idea of what unit culture was like in the 25th, or did you get a chance to experience that? Um, we went over to uh, with a, an exercise they had with the uh, South Korean Army or military. It was uh, Team Spirit back in the uh, in the 80s. Um, and we got to operate a lot with the 25th ID uh, during that time. Um, basically, we were an army that um, hadn't been to war since 75, and we were kind of um, 
trying to just work on the, the typical scenario, the wartime Cold War scenarios, um, where if, you know, the balloon went up, this, this would be the area you went to. And um, the, the 25th, they took training very seriously. And so you said you trained with South Koreans. Were you training in South Korea? Then? Yes. Yes. So there the scenario would have been presumably the North Koreans or the Chinese coming over the, the, the DMZ. Right. To that, was there any sense that that might have happened? I mean, obviously it could happen any time, but was there, was there any sort of, uh, I guess, real threat, or did you feel any real threat that that might happen? Um, not really. Uh, these were... I don't want to say scripted, but you had certain parameters you had to meet. Once you met those parameters, then it was index, and they they would uh, come in and do your after action reviews. But it was um, it was good training. It was realistic training, but the I guess the fear factor uh, really wasn't there. And um, uh, in the, during the 1980s, you this would have been what. Uh, 84 to 86, somewhere in that range, uh, during the 1980s, some veterans and some historians have observed that the U.S. Army was recovering from might, what might be considered a Vietnam hangover. Uh, did you notice any changes in morale during your time in the mid-80s, or had the Army sort of uh, gotten over that hangover and really reestablished itself during the 1980s that you, that you can tell? Um, I'm not sure that I noticed the the hangover or the the, the changeover. Um, all I know is we started down the path of, I guess, what you'd call political correctness. Um, I noticed that the the NCO clubs they used to have dancers. Well, there was no dancers now. Uh, uh, military functions they used to have alcohol. Um, you couldn't have alcohol at the at the military functions anymore unless it was approved by, I believe it was the first general in your chain of command. So, <clears throat> what were some of the uh, most memorable uh, episodes or moments uh, of your time with the twenty fifth ID? Um, I would say probably uh, we. We were deployed for Team Spirit. The, they also did uh, an uh, operation over on the Big Island of Hawaii. There's a military training center there, and we'd always be asked to go over and support those. So I, I just remember traveling a lot between either Hawaii and Korea or um, Oahu and Hawaii to support the division. Do you recall um, anything about your you know, fellow soldiers or your subordinates or your commanding officers? Are there any, any names or personalities uh, jump out at you? Yeah, actually, um, we had uh, four guys in my, my barracks room. And um, if you've ever seen uh, the movie uh, with uh, Burt Lancaster and, and Deborah Carr, you know, From Here to Eternity, they show um, what we call the quads. Um, and basically, uh, I was in B quad, and we were up on the second floor. And every time I see that movie, I get excited because they have the old uh, uh, quad quadrangles uh, barracks from uh, from the 25th. But there were four guys in my room, and um, it was uh, um, myself. There was Rich McCauley, there was Ken Musselwhite, and there was Ron Myatt, and we were by far um, not your poster children for recruiting. Um, uh, Muscle White would go downtown Honolulu and he supported most of the tattoo places down there. He had a lot of artwork. Um, McCulley was kind of a woman's man and so was Myatt. And uh, I was just kind of, you know, the country boy and that uh, kind of just went along. And nobody, you wouldn't think that 
out of this group, you'd have a retired major, uh, Muscle White made uh, command sergeant major, uh, Ron Myatt uh, made CW3 and was an Apache helicopter pilot till he hurt his back. So out of the four, three of us uh, stayed in, and you'd never guess that back in those days. Um, so you're coming, you're, you, were, you were stationed in Hawaii for three years then? Yes. Uh, then you're, you were coming to the end of, 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 of that three years. Did you consider staying in at that point, or did you, did you want to get out and, and go back to school and finish your degree, or did you consider going to become an air traffic controller on the outside? What, what affected your decision? Um, well, during um, my stay over there, I met um, an Army cook, and we eventually ended up getting married. Um, and we lived on the North Shore in a in a nice penthouse apartment that the government paid for, and so it, it, she got out before I did. Um, so it was pretty much you can stay in if you want. I'm not staying in. Um, and and one of the reasons I thought seriously about going back to college was I'd started my degree program and I wanted to finish that. And I figured I couldn't do that while I was on active duty, so it was, I'll just, you know, um, ETS, and we'll go back to Bowling Green. And ETS? I uh, know you're going to ask me that. Um, I believe it's, I call it end of, end or termination of service, or enlisted termination service. Or okay. It means your time has finished, so. I'll just let it ring. No, I, it, it'll just ring. It'll go to the to the box here. Hello. No one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. I get a lot of those. All right, so you uh, left the military, and did you go back to Bowling Green to finish your degree, or did you finish your degree elsewhere? I went back to Bowling Green, um, finished my degree, um, and while I was there, I uh, enrolled in ROTC. Uh, and the reason I did that was basically because of my commander that I had in Hawaii. Oh. Uh, Doug Gendron was uh, my, he was a platoon leader, but he was a captain, and he was also an aviator, and he um, was a really good mentor. Um, we talked a lot about um, you know future in the army and uh, what it, what things, what weaknesses, what strengths I had, and he thought I was officer material. So, when you talk about uh, mentoring and leadership, what were what were some of the things that he mentioned or he thought you had? What does it mean to be a good mentor or leader? Um, well, he, he was a good mentor um, because he was the kind of leader I wanted to be. He was very soldier-oriented, um, and even though I wasn't in a leadership position, he saw something in me that, that made him think that I had the, the quality where I could be a good leader because I, I was attentive to people's needs, and, and I, was, I was a good listener. So, all right. So, good listening, attentive to needs, uh, is that what goes in to be soldier centered, as you said? Right. Um, I I think so. To be a good leader, you, you have to be a good listener. You have to know what your soldiers are, are are telling you, and you have to kind of read between the lines sometimes. Um, and and also being a good listener is only part of it. Being able to act and take care of your soldiers. Uh, that's the other part, and that's something I needed to develop um, later on. And but taking care of your soldiers, that also would help raise, keep, raise their morale, keep their morale high, and, and other benefits. Right. All right, so you're uh, in ROTC at Bowling Green. What was your major in? Um, my major was in sport management and uh, with an emphasis on uh, marketing. Okay. 
Okay, so and and did you was that basically your junior senior year there? Uh, about about how long were you? About how many years did you go to Bowling Green? I like to say I was on the nine year plan uh, because I graduated in eighty eight. I started in seventy nine and graduated in eighty eight. But um, I, I I think it was I I had to make up some classes, so I was there about three years, um, three three and a half years going through school then once you uh, graduated uh, and you uh, got a commission um, how did you find yourself uh, working your way into transportation from air traffic control um, there's a uh, event in every ROTC cadets life called advance camp and that comes between your junior and senior year. Um, and my advanced camp was out at Fort Lewis. Um, and they have, it's kind of like a career day, it's branch day, where you go around and it's a round robin, you go to all the different branches and they give their uh, 20 minutes of why you should become an air defender or an artilleryman or an infantryman or a chemical officer. And um, the Transportation Corps had um, a very nice video presentation of all the boats that they had or ships that they had. And they had one, uh, which was the LAC V-30, which is a air-cushioned vehicle that carried cargo from the ship to the shore. And I was just enthralled with that. So I said, I want to become a transporter. But uh, it wasn't in the cards initially. Oh, really? No. When, um, after advanced camp, you get uh, assessed by your TAC officer out there, who is basically your, uh, he's your platoon leader or your company commander out there, and he does your evaluation of how well you um, held leadership positions, were a good follower, um, you met all the, the tasks that were put before you or you didn't, and, and here's why. Um, and I got, this is my life story, just average. I got a three out of five. And, and three is good because 70% of the people got threes. So I was, you know, the bell curve. I was the 70%, um, which really didn't help my goals and my pursuits to become a transporter because you get three choices. I think I put transportation, quartermaster, and I think I put field artillery as my three choices. And it didn't pan out. They branched me infantry um, and reserve forces. So that means I would have been in the Ohio National Guard, the 148th Infantry, because that's what the your your location basically is how they they do that. I was fortunate enough though to um, run into uh, a lieutenant who was leaving um, a transportation company in the reserve down in Kenton, Ohio, and they needed um, to be backfilled with with a lieutenant. And I I was accepted down there, so I did a branch transfer from infantry to transportation yeah uh, infantry is uh, from what I've read and heard infantry is kind of where you send everybody else you know if you can't score high enough and for example field artillery you probably have would have had to score per, uh, fairly high for field artillery all right so you're uh, you you make it into transportation um, and transportation is one aspect of something broadly defined or broadly called logistics. Um, could you uh, give me a definition or maybe an explanation of what logistics means and how transportation fits into logistics or is a part of logistics? I think a simple definition that I always learned was logistics are what you need to survive in a field environment. The things that, that keep you going, the food, the water, the fuel, the um, the tents, your uniforms, the repair parts to keep your trucks moving, 
And all those things have to be there for you to be able to fight the battle. There's another um, uh, sort of term or a little, uh, another term called the tail to teeth ratio. And logistics being the tail and teeth being combat arms. What does that mean to you? What, can you explain that? Um, I really hadn't heard that one. Um, it, I, I would assume it's probably the, the, the teeth wag the tail and the tail has to respond in some kind so that the teeth can do their job. Um, well, that's fair enough. Okay. Okay. The, um, turn to the United States Army at the time you were in. This would have been in really the mid, mid to late 80s that we're talking about when you just got into transportation. Uh, would have been uh, the late 1980s, yeah, I guess. 88, 89. 88, 89. Um, about, about how many men or how many units or maybe what percentage of the United States Army or if you're of the, the, uh, the section there that you knew worked in something uh, in logistics versus the combat arms. Uh, you know, when, we, when people think about the Army, they think, oh, well, everyone's an infantryman. Well, there's lots of people behind the scenes. Any idea of kind of the uh, relative percentage of the ratio between? Um, I, I'm not sure of okay. what the ratio is. I know that um, you have your combat arms, and this is the way that, that the uh, Army has kind of been divided up. Your combat arms, which is your infantry, your armor, your field artillery, air defense artillery, and then you have combat support, which would be your chemical, your um, engineers, um, signal, and then you have combat service support, which is your quartermaster, ordnance, transportation. Um, so I don't know if it's a third, less than a third, but. All right, so you were uh, posted, did you say, to a National Guard unit or to a reserve unit? A, a reserve unit in Kenton. In Kenton, and that's in Ohio. In Ohio, yeah. And uh, how did you, how did you, uh, uh, how did, or, uh, what roles did you play in that unit? And eventually, I guess where I'm getting at or where I'm leading to is how did you transition into the 1st Infantry Division? It's a, that's an interesting story in itself. Um, the first part of that, though, is I was a platoon leader for uh, a terminal transfer company. Um, and within transportation, you, of course, you have ground transportation, trucks. Uh, you have rail operations, and you have surface operations, which are ships. You need somebody to manage... Um, getting the equipment off the ships onto rail cars or trucks. So that would be the, the admission of a terminal transfer unit. And I was a platoon leader for, um, I want to say, the cargo section. Um, we actually got to do that for one of our ATs. We went to Honduras and uh, got to work uh, with the engineers um, Corps, well, the, the Army engineers down there, they were building uh, roads down there, so we got to move equipment to and from the port. And that was still with the, the reserve unit? With the reserve unit, right. Now, as far as getting onto active duty, um, I was kind of trying to figure out if I was going to be working at the steel company, you know, in the shipping department uh, the rest of my life. Um, and then I got a letter in the mail one day from the Department of the Army, and it said, uh, oops, we didn't take enough lieutenants on active duty out of your year group. Would you be interested in going? And it's like, okay. You know, and they gave you um, three choices of where you wanted to go. And I remember traveling uh, with my parents. We'd go out to Colorado um, on vacation, and we'd go right past Fort Riley. And I thought, wow, well, that's a neat place. I always remember that. And so I put Fort Riley as my first choice. And I was lucky enough to get that. And what year did this letter come in, or roughly when did uh, this letter come in? I think it came out at the end of 1988 or very early in 1989. So you uh, then did get your uh, 
first choice to go to the 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley. What was, uh, what was life like at Fort Riley? Where did you live? Did you live on base or did you live in Junction City? Um, no, we actually um, found out that the housing on post wasn't available for uh, second lieutenants for a year. So we got a, a house in Manhattan, Kansas, which is about, um, I think it's about 15 miles to the east, and that's where Kansas State University is. Um, and actually, we lucked into a, a very nice three-bedroom home uh, that was within the, the rent plus money that the, the Army gave us. So we were right there in the, in the little college campus area. It was, it was nice. And how did you find how did you find uh, the the college town and and uh, uh, life there? Was uh, did you have children at that time to go to the schools there? Or? Uh, we had a, a two year old at the time, um, so not quite school age. Yet. Not quite school age, but um, it was it was a really nice community. Uh, my first wife was from uh, Nebraska, so we were like four hours from her parents, and. Um, the community accepted military very well. There were no, um, we didn't notice any resentment or you know malice towards military in, in Manhattan. It was it was a nice place to to uh, to live really. So you moved there in early 1989. Late September 1989. September 1989. Uh, when you uh, when you joined the uh, First Infantry Division, the Big Red One. Uh, did you have any idea of the history and the heritage of that unit before you joined, or how did you learn about the history and heritage of that unit? Um, basically, I went in blind. Uh, I really didn't know anything about uh, the 24th Trans Company I went to, or the battalion, or even the division. Um, but you do get a lot of officer calls. Um, and you'd have them at the officer club, or you'd have them at the museum, or you know you'd have them in different places on post. And it's a very historic place, a um, lot of lot of rich history. And you you get to to go to the different places, and 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 they basically your senior leaders would tell you um, about the history of Fort uh, Fort Riley. What are some of the uh, what are what are one or two of the most memorable places you visited, or memorable speeches, or explanations you heard? Oh wow! Um, they had at one time they had a buffalo corral up on um, on Custer Hill, which is the main housing area of uh, Fort Riley, and it was out at the ammunition supply point, the ASP. And as a matter of fact, one of our units in the battalion was, they managed that ammunition supply point. So we'd get to go out there um, and, and just watch the buffalo, uh, which was kind of neat. And every now and then you'd get uh, buffalo burgers in the uh, mess hall, and I'm not sure how that happened, but we'd get that. Or going down on main post to see um, Old Bill which is the, the cavalryman statue that's down there, and uh, Custer House, which is a quarters that was uh, actually, I believe, uh, uh, General Custer had lived in. So uh, you were a second lieutenant at that point, uh, newly minted second lieutenant, or almost newly minted, and uh, then what was your unit and your uh, specialty? Uh, within the 1st Infantry Division? We, um, I, I, I was attached to uh, 24th Transportation Company, um, and we were a, a, a non-divisional uh, tenant activity on Fort Riley. Um, I, we belonged to the 541st Maintenance Battalion, and they had two, um, a, what they called a DS, direct service, direct support, and a GS, which is general support maintenance companies, and they had the um, the ammunition company, and they had the 24th Trans Company. Um, we belonged to the 937th Engineer Group, which had another roundout battalion of uh, 
tenant uh, engineer battalions and companies. Um, and our mission basically was to support Fort Riley um, in, in transportation with our, we had 40 foot flatbed trailers. Um, so we would do, we'd get a lot of trash missions from the ranges. Uh, we would get, um, uh, when they would go to the National Training Center, we would support those by line hauling uh, some of their equipment on our trucks. And that was, that was great experience that most transporters wouldn't get because you never really did really real day day-to-day -day missions like that. We were on the road four days at a time going out and um, boy, that was just great training. Yeah, National Training Center, where is that? That's at uh, Fort Irwin, California. So we would, uh, we would convoy and usually it'd be 20 to 30 trucks. Um, we would convoy um, from Fort Riley to Fort Irwin. So would you be taking uh, uh, G um, Humvees or, uh, or tanks or uh, Bradleys out there to National Training Center? Right. Most of the, uh, because of the weight limitations, we would take what they would call their advanced party equipment, which would be, um, at the time, were the, the Cuckvies, which were the Chevys, the, the Chevy pickup trucks, the Chevy Blazers. Um, we would have some M113s, which were the little tracked uh, command posts or the infantry carriers at the time before the Bradleys really hit. Um, and we'd take some of their support vehicles and support equipment out there. Yeah, the, uh, now uh, was the 1st Infantry Division using M1 Abrams tanks by then, or were they still yes. using the M60s? Yeah, they were, they were up to the M1s. And those, those, I guess, would be over weight limit at about 60 tons. Right. Yeah, could, we, could could you have hauled those no, if you need? No, no, you would need um, what they have now is the heavy equipment transporter, which can take them. But you do have road restrictions. Every state has their own uh, limitations. How did the uh, how did the uh, first infantry division get the uh, the tanks out, or did they use tanks that were already uh, already? at the National Training Center. Yeah, they, um, they have a, a, what they call a rotational set of equipment out at uh, National Training Center. And at the time, I think it was a battalion set that they would use, I'm not sure, but I know they've increased it up to brigade size. Um, so we've got uh, you uh, going back and forth to National Training Center. It's 1989, 1990. Uh, when did you begin to get an idea that there were problems in the Middle East, specifically Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and that in and that, and that area? Mm. Um, well, in August, uh, we were put on alert. In August 1990, we were put on alert. Um, and basically it was, you could deploy tomorrow, you could deploy three weeks from now, it could be a month. Um, and within our uh, battalion, there were, I believe, three companies at first that were put on alert, and then the entire battalion. Um, and the unique thing about being in a non-divisional unit, we were what they called echelon above core. And that was, that was a unique term I had never heard before. But they said, you guys are uh, an echelon above core unit. You don't belong to the division. You won't go over with your battalion that you're assigned to here. You'll go, you'll, uh, when you go overseas, you'll be attached to a transportation group. And basically, they will dole you out where they see fit or wherever the need dictates. So we didn't really belong to 1st Infantry once we, were, once we left Fort Riley. All right. Um, can we step back just a little sure. bit, and can you give me an idea of of the uh, uh, of the number of men or number of vehicles in uh, the company or the five forty five forty first maintenance battalion? How many men? How many vehicles? How much? Can you give me a, a, an, an estimate on those? Um, I'd think from. 
I remember there was probably I know we had three truck platoons each platoon had 20 trucks so we had 60 trucks total each truck had two 40-foot trailers assigned to them because you could drop one off and then pick one up um, so we probably had I want to say 120 people um, in the in the 24th trans uh, company and then the, the maintenance battalion um, total probably including us was probably about 750 800 I think okay Okay, well, that, that's useful to know in terms of just, you know, kind of numbers. Um, so when did you uh, actually get word that you would be deployed uh, to the Middle East? Uh, understanding that you're in this echelon above core, uh, you know, sort of status. But when did you get word and when did you actually deploy? Well, like I said, we got word in August, uh, right after the event, uh, right after the Iraqis uh, invaded uh, Kuwait, we got word that you were going to be put on alert. And we stayed on alert until um, end of October. We deployed at the 29th of October. All right, so what was that deployment like? Did you go over in, uh, uh, by boat, by ship, uh, or was there already equipment waiting for you? Did you fly over and pick up equipment there? How did that whole... Uh, uh, voyage or trip work? Wow. Um, <laughs> we'd been through so many exercises of, of you, you go down, you um, get your shots, you get your physicals, you do your wills, you do your powers of attorney, you do all the admin stuff that you need to do and then you kind of sit and wait. Um, once you're officially notified of deployment, then you prep your equipment for shipment. We rail loaded all of our trucks and our, all of our uh, military containers, um, and those went to the port. Um, I think it was Beaumont. They went out of Beaumont. Um, and then. Beaumont, Texas? Beaumont, Texas, yes. Um, and then um, later on, we were scheduled for flights, and we flew out of um, Topeka, Kansas, and. We flew from Topeka to Dover, I believe, and then Dover, Delaware. Dover, Dover, Delaware, um, and then from Dover, um, we flew over to. I think we had a stop over in Siginella, Italy, and then from there right into um, Damam, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So, what, what was your initial reaction like? Were you were you worried? Were you excited? Were were you anxious? What was what was this? What were the emotions going on? Especially after then, you would have had what twenty four hours in the plane or something along those lines. Um, before we deployed, um, we were kind of anxious to get on with it because we'd been on alert since August, and there's only so much NBC training, and, you know, nuclear, biological, and chemical training you can do. Um, before it becomes like old and you're doing this stuff all the time um, and also at this time during that August to October time frame I got notified that we had our name had come up on the housing list so I had to move my wife and my my two-year-old daughter from Manhattan to uh, Fort Riley and oh by the way she was eight and a half months pregnant at the time so we we're expecting you know our, our second child coming along so it would have been nice um, had that happened prior to going on alert but you know there was the move the the, the, the pregnancy the deployment keeping tabs on people who didn't want to go you know we had a couple of those too but uh, it was it was, you know what? Let's let's just go do it, get it over with, and come home. So, what was NBC training like? This is um, nuclear biological. What is it? Nuclear biological chemical chemical training. Yeah. What did that entail? Um, usually, it was a performance standard. You had so many seconds to what they call don your mask, clear it, and you know sound the the alert. Um, 
that's just part of it. The other is uh, what they call a mission-oriented protective posture mop. Mop gear is the protective uh, top and bottom gloves, boots that uh, keep you uh, safe in a chemical or, or biological environment. Um, and after a while, you know, you could become fairly proficient at putting your mask on, but it it really lacked uh, any kind of realism. So the soldiers kind of get bored, so you had to think of unique ways to, uh, you could work, you'd do your daily tasks in mop level, but that's not practical and the mop gear wears out after a certain amount of time. So we would play, um, during PT, we'd play like mop football, uh, and you'd be in complete mop gear and trying to run and, and tackle and I mean it was you learn you really can't breathe uh, very heavily in those masks uh, so it, it was it was interesting it was it was always a challenge to make training um, effective and of course you're uh, are you still a second lieutenant still this second time? lieutenant still yeah. suck second lieutenant and then and uh, were you in your own platoon or right. yep. I had third platoon and then you would be also trying to generate some interest or excitement or something among you know eighteen year old privates and such right yeah and it um it wasn't always the privates it was the sergeants sometimes you had problems with too um, you know i mean it 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 was it was interesting that uh they were the ones who really wanted to go over because um, they had relatives that had been in Vietnam. We had some of those that, that had been um, real, real close to, to relatives who'd been in Vietnam, and, and they, you know, it was a family tradition. Can you remember any of these, any of your sergeants in particular, any names or, or stories about them? Oh, sure. Oh, please. <laughs> well, there was... Um, my my platoon sergeant when I got to Fort Riley was uh, Sergeant First Class Jerry Maloney, and um, he taught me uh, as all good NCOs are supposed to do. They're supposed to teach lieutenants. They're supposed to train lieutenants. Your senior NCOs and and Jerry Maloney did a, a very good job of teaching me. Jerry uh, had a rough go of it um, in the uh, he was in Korea, and he was issued, they have these giant boots, these cold weather boots. Um, they're called Mickey Mouse boots because they're just so obnoxiously large. But um, he had those on, I guess, during a, a winter training exercise over there and uh, got frostbite and lost two of his toes. So there was, you know, of course, that was Eight Toes Maloney that, uh, you know, and that was the nickname that we had, but you know, I remember Sergeant Smith was one of my squad leaders, um, and Sergeant Barber, who was my platoon leader when we went over to uh, to Saudi, and Sergeant uh, Dunlap, and um, Sergeant Ratliff. I remember all those guys. Uh, when you say that a senior NCO teaches his new lieutenants or his officers, what what types of things did the sergeant teach you? Um, well, when you go through officer basic course, they teach you what's in the book. This is how you, uh, th these are military customs and courtesies. These are uh, articles of war. These are the code of, uh, the uniform code of military justice. You know, these are all the things you need to know. What the NCOs train you on are common sense things. How to interact with the troops. How to interact with your NCOs so that you don't come off and say, darn it, Sergeant, I told you to do that. Well, why? Because I said so. You know, that's never a good answer. They would, you know, you got to have a reason why you want something done. Just tell them the reason. You know, don't lie to your troops. Um, you know, keep it honest. Be approachable. And, you know, you'll get along just fine. Listen to your NCOs. Take guidance from them because they've been in the military more than a day or you know a year or whatever. Do you find that uh, having been uh, uh, in the enlisted ranks earlier, do you think that that was a 
beneficial to you as an officer? Um, I, I do. Um, I really do. I, I know what it was like to be single um, and, and be on the duty roster all the time um, when, you were, when you were a private, private first class or specialist. And you were the CQ runner, or you know, um, you were, you had to pull duty over Christmas, or, you know, I knew what basic training was like. I know what the private had to go through. And I knew what AIT was like, and I knew, um, you know, some things that some of the other officers didn't know, from a from a firsthand perspective. And AIT stands for Advanced Infantry Training. Individual training. All right, advanced in individual training. Right. Good. So um, you're, you take this long plane flight, hopping from place to place over to, you said, Saudi Arabia. What was your initial reaction when you deplaned? Mm. Um, I was nervous. Needless to say, I was, I was nervous because there was the threat of Scud missiles. We'd heard about that, um, you know, and the use of chemical weapons, um, you know, and the, the army was massed. Um, you know, the Iraqi army was massed to the north, um, you know, and it, they might not stop at, at Kuwait. They might just come across the border. And uh, when we flew into Dammam, the major port on the, uh, the eastern shore on the uh, Arabian Gulf, um, it was all lit up. And I'm thinking, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, why is everything lit up? And I'm thinking back to, like, World War II during the blackouts, you know. I mean, but every light in, in Dammam was on, and I, that just freaked me out. It's like, wow, there's no light discipline or anything like that. So it was, it was kind of unnerving. Was the, uh, was the impression or the, uh, uh, I guess, impression of the Iraqi army that it was indeed the fourth or fifth largest and most powerful army in, in the world? Was, was, that, what, was that what you were being told in your uh, briefings and so right. on? And, and they had a lot of uh, American-built equipment. They had 113s. They had um, American artillery. And, I mean, through the years, you know, they'd been um, uh, foreign mil military sales to, to Iraq. So, you know, we'd see our own equipment used against us, basically. And, of course, you know, earlier on in the 80s, the uh, Iran was the bad guy, and, you know, right. Iraq was, well, maybe not the good guy, but not as bad as Iran. Right. right. So um, <clears throat> what was it like uh, living and working then in Saudi Arabia? If you got there and... and what I said right around early November it must have been the first or second of November when you arrived in country, uh, and then the uh, ground war doesn't get started for uh, two or three months thereafter. It's late February before the ground war gets started. What was it like living and working in Saudi Arabia in the interim? It was uh, it was a culture shock. It was um, the first couple days we spent at. The port itself. Uh, we were bussed in from the uh, from the airport to the port, um, and we were put in these big warehouses. And they had cots set up. I mean, just thousands and thousands of cots because there were people coming in from all over, um, you know, CONUS, uh, the continental United States, and um, nobody knew what to do with all these troops that were coming in. I mean, the request was out there, but there wasn't the, the support system on, on ground to, to support this many people all at one time. Um, so basically we didn't know who we were going to be attached to uh, within the first, I'd say, 24 to 48 hours. We didn't know who, our, uh, who we'd be working with. So we kind of just sat there and it was real interesting. They, they had... Um, no port johns but what they had done is constructed wooden um, outhouses. Um, and, I mean, the flies were just, that's what I remember the most about the port. It was just the flies, the amount of flies, just tons of them. And was the, was the heat uh, 
What was the temperature like there? It wasn't bad during the day. Like I said, it was it was November, so um, it was probably 80s, maybe 90s. And then at night? At night, it was it was cool. It was um, 60s, 70s. It was it was comfortable. So what so what happened uh, after the first 48 hours? You're in these big warehouse kind of, you know, uh, cot cot cities, if you will, and then you're going to be placed with a particular unit or assigned to a larger unit. When did you find out? Um, it was probably the second or third day. Um, the company commander came back and uh, he gave us a briefing, said we would be moving down the road um, to a place called Batar, and it was basically just a little uh, work compound that the Saudis had for one of the port, civilian port companies that worked there. Um, and we moved into air-conditioned uh, rooms, and it was, life was good. Compared to the flies. Yes, the, compared to the, the flies. Port of Johns. All right, we're going to stop tape. It is July 28, 2008. My name is David Ulbrich, and I am in Van Wert, Ohio, interviewing Major James Jones as part of the Cantini First Division Oral History Project. We are on tape number two. Picking up with your experience in Saudi Arabia um, during what would be Desert Shield, the, uh, the, could you classify that as Desert Shield when, when you were yes. there, the defensive uh, and mobilization process? Um, did you have occasion to uh, interact with coalition forces? Uh, there were many different nations that were represented there, or did you interact with them later on during Desert Storm? Um, we probably interacted um, less frequently than some of the other units. We um, Later in the war, we probably dealt more with the Brits uh, than, than anybody else. So um, when you were assigned to... Uh, uh, you know, larger units, were you still considered this echelon above core status where you would be plugged in as needed wherever, if a different division or a different unit needed something transported, were you still plugged in in that, in that function? Right. What was your, uh, what was, if there was a typical day, what was your day like, or did mm -hmm. it vary every day? Uh, it varied every day. Um, I mean, it was either moving... Um, your trucks at night or uh, during the day to go to a forward um, ammunition supply point, basically, or an ammunition transfer point. We would get cargo offloaded from the, from the uh, ships in the port, and a lot of them were carrying ammo, and that was the major impetus, was to fill up the, the transfer points and the supply points with, with ammo and then move them forward. So we, most of our missions were uh, moving um, mortar, artillery, and uh, what they call the MLRS, the multiple launch rocket system um, pods. So you would pull up with your, uh, you know, your tractor trailer and pick up a load and drop it off and take an empty tractor trailer or an empty trailer back with you and just go back and forth. Right. About how, what was the distance from... Uh, the port to one of these, or did it vary? It varied. Um, uh, we had some that were relatively close. I mean, it was like a two-hour trip. Um, but you got to imagine you're not doing, you know, 70 miles an hour. You're doing about 45 miles an hour in a convoy. Um, and then some of them were, were all day. I mean, you were on the road all day. I remember going from um, the port of Damam over to... Uh, what they called KKMC, King Khalid Military City, and there was a log a logistics base that they were building up. Uh, I believe that was Log Base Bravo. Um, and we would make runs from the port to there, uh, which just went against transportation doctrine because you weren't supposed to do long hauls. They were supposed to have trailer transfer points where you dropped those and you went back and picked up more loads, and you didn't go the whole distance. There were truck companies waiting, but they didn't have that infrastructure set up at that time. So we did some rather 
laborious uh, convoys. The uh, <coughs> this must have uh, caused wear and tear on your on your equipment, on your vehicles, on your trucks. Uh, how long did it take for trucks to start, well, breaking down? Um, that's a good question because we had uh, some of the older what they called the M915s and the, we had the the first go round of the M915s and they had a 16 speed transmission and it was an air assist I had never seen one before um, but basically you tap the shift lever and the it was air actuated um, and it shifted transmission and it made a unique sound it was ch -ch -ch -ch, and then you would, they, my NCOs taught me how to drive, so that was kind of odd, too, that you'd have an officer driving. But uh, they would break down um, not so much from um, overuse. It was just age. You, know, you had a lot of miles on them to begin with because we used them a lot in in CONUS, well, you know, in our, our normal missions. So uh, anything else... Um, we went through a lot of engines, a lot of transmissions. And so this would be uh, spare parts that were coming in. Uh, in. In your experience or to your knowledge, about how long did it take to, say, the uh, engine goes uh, breaks down or the transmission breaks down, about how long did it take to order a new one and get it shipped in, or did you already have spares available? Uh, tell me about that maintenance process. Yeah, the maintenance process was um, uh, basically, you know, and, and, and every soldier, soldier will tell you that you do PMCS before you get on the vehicle, and if there's a deadlining issue, you write it up, and it goes through the maintenance section. And, and we were, at that time, we were attached to 180th Trans Battalion out of Fort Hood, and they had their own maintenance uh, material section, and they could go through... Um, core, which is uh, higher than division, they could go through core to find assets in country, and then they could locate them. And usually it was, the, if you needed a replacement transmission, you were going out to go pick it up. I mean, it was placed on order. You got uh, a response back within a day uh, if there was or wasn't. And if it, there wasn't, that means it had to come in from overseas. So it could be, it could be a while. To what degree did that, uh, over time, as your vehicles really wore down from age and also from sand corrosion and a variety of other things, how, how did that affect your overall efficiency? Or did you have more trucks coming in so you could cannibalize? I guess I, I'm asking a number of questions at the same time. but um, I, um, it, it we never sent all 60 trucks on the road at one time. Usually it was a platoon's worth of about 20 trucks. So you had um, a pool within the company to borrow from. If you needed, um, you know, 15 trucks you and one platoon didn't have 15 good trucks, then you borrowed what you could from within. It was It was always shifting, and sometimes within the battalion, they would shift assets to, to make up. So, I mean, we had four truck uh, companies within the battalion. So there were a lot of assets they could pull. So we always made mission, but it, we had our own um, deadline alley, you know, with, with trucks, and it seemed to get bigger all the time. But as the American soldiers so capable of doing, they uh, found ways to improvise, and I'm not saying that, any of my soldiers would ever do anything like this, but if there was a truck that was broken down and abandoned on the side of the road, you know, at the time, <clears throat> if they could find parts on it, they did. So cannibalization. On the road, yeah. On the road, yeah. Right, right. What did you, um, what were the uh, biggest maintenance problems? Was it an engine? Was it transmission? Did it come from, you know, sand corrosion? Or what were what were some of the problems that that you faced tires 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 we had probably more issues with tires because 
these were basically it was a commercial tractor like you'd see going down the highway um, and they used road tires as opposed to tactical tires like you'd have on a on a Humvee or uh, you know or a, a, an army five ton so these are basically commercial truck tires and they would wear the, on the on the sand, the coarse sand, the fine sand, the roadways, which were different kind of asphalt than what we're used to here in the states. Um, so yeah, we went through a lot of tires. Any idea of a, of a number or uh, a dozen a day per truck, or any or a dozen a trip? Any any idea? Um, maybe another way to ask is how many miles could you get out of a tire? Any any concept? It I don't I don't think there's a, a a standard answer for that one because it would it depend on the time of the year you'd go through more in the warm weather than you would in the cooler weather but in the cooler weather you're also operating more off-road with our trucks which in the uh, operator's manual tells them not to take these trucks off-road well you're at war you gotta yeah do you're what at you war gotta, you gotta, you gotta do, do what, you, what gotta. you do right and a lot of these log bases were not on um nice what they call class a roads which we drive on every day here uh, these were um, out in the middle of the desert where the engineers had to basically take bulldozers to create roads to go to these uh, log bases so you were always in, in the in the dirt with these things but i you know i, I remember coming in off convoys and we'd be changing um, probably three or four trucks would have at least one flat if not and they had to change those out before they you know uh, went to bed or that truck had to be mission capable and ready for the next day so um, no specific numbers but a noticeable uh, noticeable um, uh, user a noticeable number of tires needed to be changed or replaced or switched out or right. whatever yep. and, uh, and soldiers became very proficient at doing that too did um, when you talk about tactical tires uh, on the, I guess the combat vehicles, did did was 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 there a change made to get to upgrade your tires for your trucks and transport that were better tires and more durable, had longer life? Was there any ever any any, any effort to do that? I, I don't know. Uh, we never saw it though at a, at the user level. There might have been a push, um, but. Like I said, we normally um, would get uh, almost a trailer full of, of tires to, uh, I don't know, maybe every three months or something like that. All right. Um, moving to a slightly uh, different topic, uh, back to the, to the cultural uh, shock of being in Saudi Arabia. Once you move to your, uh, I guess, more permanent billets, the uh, the air conditioned and uh, 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 area that you moved in after the first couple of days, what was life like then? Was there? Did you have a, a compound that you could go to for uh, to watch American baseball, or were you were you interacting on a regular basis with the Saudis? Can you s speak to that? Um, initially. When we were running convoys out of the port, um, there really wasn't a lot of time um, to sit back and, and do the leisure activities, I guess you call it. Um, and we really didn't have, um, the, the only interaction we had with the Saudis was basically the guards at the port. Um, and they would come in, and sometimes we'd have to deal with some of the the um, officials from um, the the port itself when we were offloading ships or you know getting uh, stuff. So we really didn't have a, a whole lot of um, interaction with the Saudis. But when we did, it was I mean brief, and it was you know just making sure that we we're supposed to be where we were and not where we weren't supposed to be. Okay. What about um, women and minorities in your unit? Did you have women assigned and minorities assigned to your unit and how did they perform? Um, 
it was real interesting. Um, there were, like I said, three platoons. So you had a platoon leader, um, a lieutenant for each of the platoons. Um, we had two female platoon leaders, and uh, my company commander was the other male of the officers. Um, and then we had a lot of, I'd say probably, each platoon had one or two female soldiers, and our maintenance section had a couple and our headquarters section. So we probably had uh, 10, 12 females in the, in the, in the company. And uh, a lot of minorities. And uh, did you perceive issues or problems among between men and women or the minorities uh, with the Caucasians? Or was everyone just so busy trying to get things done that there wasn't time to have problems? Um, that was the nice thing about our unit. We'd been together um, for such a long time. And uh, I think they came out with stop loss um, right at the beginning of, of Desert Shield. So we went over with a pretty um, seasoned, I guess you call them seasoned unit that had been together for a while. Cohesive, so, would you yeah, say? Yeah, I'd those? say cohesive, yeah. They, so. they, everybody has issues. Right. Uh, and I'd like to think that we live in a perfect society, but we don't. And the, there were some rifts, but, I mean, it was the same stuff you got back at Fort Riley. In the barracks, you know, so I didn't notice anything um, uh, out of the ordinary. I mean, we'd been used to working, you know, having females in the unit. We knew how to to deal on a daily basis with with that issue and with the issue with minorities. And um, I mean, you know, we just tried to and mission accomplishment was the first thing. So you can put your other things aside, you know, until the mission got done. Um. How did the uh, how did the female soldiers adapt to, uh, to to the degree that they did interact with uh, uh, the Saudis and within the Middle Eastern cultures? How did they adapt to that that you could see? Um, I saw some resentment um, because you know they were told if you go and and every now and then we be able to go into the mom and go shopping and stuff but they would say you know females have to be you know basically their head had to be covered no hair and you know which meant that they kept their, their hair up underneath their hat uh we were in uniform the whole time um and there there was resentment i mean they knew basically that the women in in the middle east were treated differently than most American women were used to being treated. So, but, um, you know, they went along with it. Uh, and that was, you know, one of the general orders, you know, is you will do these things not to offend our, our host nation. That's, uh, well, it that goes into the Army's chain of command. You don't, right. you know, just, the order is an order, so you know, right. got to do what you are ordered to do. Okay. Um, so we're working our way through November into December uh, and into the new year. Uh, you, have, you have the air war starting, I believe, in mid-January 1991. Did that affect your day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities, the start of the air war at all? Or as your, I guess one, another way to say this, the air war starts and then you get the ultimatum, and then the ground war starts late February, February 24th, 1991, I believe. Ramping up to that, did your activities intensify? Mm. Um, yes. All right. um, actually, back in November, um, while we were still in Damam, in the Damam port area, um, there was a call from somewhere. Uh, that there needed to be a um, intermediate staging area set up at Al Jabail, which was north of Damam, uh, because they were talking about bringing in the Seventh Corps troops from Germany. Um, so I drew the short straw, and uh, I was selected to go up there with um, the battalion XO and some support staff. So we went up to Al Jabail, left the 
I guess the comfort and security of the the units and went up and set up this intermediate staging area. During that time the battalion deployed to uh, KKMC uh, from Damam. Um, now our footing was you know prepping to receive unknown numbers of, of troops. We had to set up tents, water, latrines, set up food, rations, maintenance areas, set up transport for their equipment for onward movement and staging and it was it was very interesting. Things moved at a very hectic pace. Um and we were we were busy, you know, and I mean almost every minute of every day. Did you get very much sleep at that time? Um I I got a lot of sleep during the day because I was the night um ops officer in charge at the at the field site. So. This is twelve hours on, twelve hours right. off. Basically yeah. seven days a week though. Right. All right, so you're you're setting up all this, basically all the all the necessities for, as you say, X number of thousands of men, and seven corps. That's what you're saying out of bringing in the people from Germany. That's uh, the first infantry division, which they added some armor units to it to make it a heavy division, and two armored divisions. So right. that could have been sixty thousand men. I, I'm not sure of the numbers. I just know that uh, we started out with a base plan, and it just continued to grow. It, it just got very large, and um, the number of people, the support people, uh, that was there when I left was just it was just enormous. Uh, Any idea of in the thousands or tens of thousands? I would say at least uh, ten thousand soldiers passed through there, uh, plus their equipment. Um, AMC, Army Material Command, set up um, paint booths for the Abrams tanks because most of them came in, they were green, right. cam green right. camouflage. Yeah, well, the you know, right. tanks designed and deployed to fight the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact in Europe. Right, so they had, uh, they had the cark paint. Uh, the desert tan, and they painted not only tanks, but you know trucks and, and other equipment that came in. So the, w w would they have been carting that equipment on your trucks or units like yours? No, basically there was a, a large um, number of host nation trucks that they contracted that would carry them from Algebail out to their assembly areas. But it was like a just. A little city, basically, that we had set up. And so, uh, and, and so, when did you go to this city to it, set this up? This was in November. In November, later on in November. Right. And then, how long were you in this? What was this called again? This uh, intermediate staging area. Intermediate staging area. How long were you? Until um, February. Just um, it, well, I know we were there during the ground war, or I mean the air war, when it started. It would have um, been mid-January. Right. Um, and then I would say around Valentine's Day, we, um, I was moved back to my unit at, uh, at Log Base Bravo. And then, um, so while you're there, uh, <laughs> who, who are your subordinates? Did you, were you placed in charge of contractors doing construction work or soldiers you know building tents and that sort of thing what was what was your what what, what were your tasks uh, my tasks were to assist uh, in the development and um, basically the assignment of assets to for the initial build-up and we had um, CBs and Marines come in to pour concrete bases for the tents and then we had um, the details to set up tents, so I was in charge of that. And then there were, you know, latrines to be built that we had to make sure we had X amount of latrines per, you know, area. And then, you know, water trucks had to come in. And then there was, of course, rations that had to be stored. And, I mean, basically they were getting three MREs a day when they initially came in until we could set up something where they could get a, a hot meal. And then, of course, there's trash disposal, there's the maintenance setup, there's um, light sets that had to be put up for night operations, and it was just a, you know, just a, 
a laundry list of things that we had to do on a daily basis to, to make sure that. That's a lot of responsibility and a lot of things to think about for what, still a second lieutenant or right. you made first lieutenant yet? Not yet. So second lieutenant. Looking back, um, you know, had, had your previous training helped, for example, maybe thinking on such so many things going on as an air, air traffic controller, did that help you, do you think, handle all these complexities and all these, you know, elastic and inelastic variables that went on? Do you think that that, that helped you deal with it? Um, I, to, to a certain extent, but I, I think the realism of, of what we were doing, and that was the only thing we were doing. I mean, you know, that was, that was your mission. You didn't have any other, uh, any other things to worry about or time to worry about them. Um, you know, it was, it was an immense task. I had a great, uh, great leader, uh, and, and who, who, by the way, was a female, um, which is a female major, uh, Susan Halter. And she was in charge of that whole area and did a wonderful job. She was a, a, a great teacher for me. Um, she's, I still talk to her to this day. Outstanding. <clears throat> so you're, you're there in November and December and January. Uh, how far are you away from the Iraqi army? How far would their uh, would their units have been? Can you do you have any guesstimation? Um, without looking at a map, I I know it was like less than a hundred kilometers to the border. Uh, I know we had scuds drop in the bay um, from from them. I mean they tried launching and the scuds were so unreliable as far as I guess uh, pinpointing. But um, you know we were close enough that. Uh, that the threat was real. Was there ever, did a, did a Scud missile attack ever get anywhere near you, or did the, how often did the alarms go off, that sort of thing? Um, the alarms went off all the time, um, and it, it got to, uh, remember I told you about the training in Fort Riley where, you know, you would train and train and train. Well, the alarms, every time they did a Scud launch, no matter where it went, the entire theater went to MOP4, it seemed. So there was always a, a, an NBC alert. You know, you were always in, you know, MOP level one with just your mask, or you were in MOP4, and I mean, like I said, we did have, uh, on one or two occasions, scuds fell in the bay uh, just to the east of, of our location. Um, so after a while, though, you kind of didn't take them as seriously. Because, becomes routine. It yeah, becomes, becomes yeah, and it becomes obnoxious, uh, actually, with the NBC because it's such a pain in the butt. And, you know, you'd, you'd get an NBC alert, and, yeah, we shouldn't take this lightly, but is this a real thing this time or not? And, you know, it just, you know, where is it headed? Where, you know, where is it launched? And you kind of did your own little factoring. So uh, what was your... What was your reaction when the air war started? This would have been mid-January. Did you think that a ground war was was soon to follow, or do you do you even recall that, or were you just too busy to pay that much attention? Um, I remember the night it happened, the uh, the air war, because well, we didn't know, um, but there were some troops that came in from convoys to the north of us, and they were in Mop Four. And it's like, well, we hadn't heard, you know, a scud launch or anything like that. I said, no, the air war had started. Oh, okay. So, and I'm not sure why this, this happened, but we all went into bunkers. And um, we were given instructions on how to take our, what they call these PB pills, uh, which were supposed to be an antidote against nerve agent that came in in case. But you were supposed to take these to prevent... Um, the side effects, I guess. And so we were given our PB pills, and we had our injectors, and we were we were set. We were ready. We were kind of put into focus that this is a real shooting war now. 
did that, how did you feel about that? Did that raise anxiety levels higher than usual? Or Oh, yeah, it did. I mean, we were, we were close enough we could hear the jets taking off, and sometimes they take off fast enough where they create a sonic boom, and you didn't know if that was a sonic boom or a missile coming in, and um, it kind of made you look every time you heard something or saw a jet taking off. It made you a little jumpy. Yeah, and, and you knew that, you know, some of those jets wouldn't come back. So, you know, it, yeah, the, the realism of war hit us then, I think. With the ground, or uh, with, with the with air, air war. war. Right. And then uh, uh, what was your reaction with the, uh, when the ground war started? Although you said by about Valentine's Day you were back at the log base, right. further back. I guess when you transfer or when you uh, were uh, when you moved back there, um, what were your roles or what were your duties back there at the log base? And then I'll get to the ground war. Okay. But. Um, basically, I went back to uh, convoy commander. Um, you know, I, I got back with my troops, with my platoon, and um, uh, we ran daily missions. Um, and the nice thing was we during this time. Um, when I moved back up there, they were doing the, the shift of the divisions, uh, the crossover, or however you want to call that. Um, we got to support some of the units out of the 1st Infantry Division, so we got to catch up with uh, some of the folks we knew from Fort Riley that we hadn't seen for a while. So it was kind of kind of nice to see some faces from home. Uh, in terms of your daily missions, uh, were you running your trucks 24-7 at that point to, uh, or running some trucks around the clock to get ammunition, and, and, and what were you transporting? Yeah, uh, we, we ran a lot more um, uh, of the ammo uh, convoys uh, further north, um, and we always had trucks on the road, it, it seemed like. Um, it might not have been 24, but it was 18. I mean, there were some really long days. Um, and you'd be pulling a convoy about every other day because uh, you, you couldn't do it every day. You just exhaust the guys uh, and girls. Sure. All right, so you're um, doing these convoys. Now, are these still the long-distance nine-hour convoys, or had enough infrastructure been put in where you could do shorter hops, return, do shorter hops, and return within a few hours? Some of them were still the long ones. I remember uh, we went from Log Base Bravo to Log Base Charlie, which I believe was up Tapline Road to the west, picked up equipment and moved that down to Al Jabail, which was just an incredible distance. And, and then we came back that night. When you say equipment, is that, uh, would that be more uh, rocket launchers or would it be other equipment? Actually, it was forklifts, I believe, forklifts and uh, material handling equipment that needed to go back to that area. All right, so you went back to Log Base Bravo, Bravo. Uh, around uh, Valentine's Day. So then about 10 days later, the ground war started. What was that? What was that? What was your first reaction, or what was that like? To, or did you even have any idea? We we really didn't know, um, and and basically it was uh, the same missions, you know. And and during the entire um, Operation Desert Shield, um, it, our protective posture was we had flak vests. You had your web gear. You had your weapon. You had your MBC gear and your in your rucksack. You wore your uh, Kevlar. Um, and you had your mask at your side, so that was the uniform, uh, and it stayed the same. So we we had practiced that enough that we were comfortable enough in driving like that. So it it really wasn't much of a change for us because we were still moving, um, you know, mostly ammo up and down Tapline Road. So um, did your supply lines or did your convoy routes your uh, your routes lengthen as the uh, seven core moved further into Iraq? In other words, did you have longer, longer uh, drives? 
Um, no, not really, because like you mentioned, the, the infrastructure had been set in that you could run to a trailer transfer point, drop your trailers, and pick up empties um, for the majority of those. And then you'd have um, other core units or echelons above core units that would that were further uh, away, and they would come pick up. And, yeah, it, it was operating like it was supposed to. I would imagine with the speed at which the uh, coalition forces moved into Iraq that somewhere along the line, closer to the front, that was moving very fast yes. into Kuwait and on into Iraq, somewhere along the line I'm guessing that there would be someone's uh, time on the road would have been expanding. Maybe not yours, but you're further enough back with the log base so you would just have more of a set uh, length of travel to a particular transfer point and then come right. back. But somewhere along the lines, I'm guessing that someone had... Oh, yeah, had, your uh, divisional uh, truck units, I'm sure, um, had just enormous uh, missions going back and forth, you know, for the, the, the ammo, the, the rations, the water, the fuel and all that. They, I remember going up to one of the uh, assembly areas with our trucks, and it, during that time frame, um, you remember seeing the, the pictures of the, the trucks going across the desert. Well, they always left tracks because that was the rainy season, and uh, our trucks with our just normal tires got stuck a lot. So that, that made it real interesting, but yeah, speaking of the weather, you don't think of a rainy season in the desert, but it was raining and the wind was blowing and visibility was down to, what, 200 meters at times during the ground war, the, you know, February 24th. Uh, did that, you said your trucks got bogged down. and had, what, what other effects did that, did that weather have on, on your uh, uh, efficiency? Um, well, besides having to get uh, some kind of equipment to pull your trucks out, um, it, it would tear up transmissions. I mean, I think that's where we had the majority of our transmissions that were really uh, needed replacing was, I mean, you'd sit there and spin your tires for so long, you'd burn out transmissions. So, and then... I mean, they, they decided after a certain point in time that, well, we're not going to send these trucks off-road anymore. You get the tactical trucks. You you drop at the side of the, the hardball, and then the tactical trucks come. Tactical, would those be deuce and a half? Uh, deuce and a half, five tons. The five-ton tractors that uh, most of the divisional transportation units had, the support battalions um, and their trailers. Yep. So uh, the, the ground war started uh, late February. It runs for several days before they start their negotiating. Um, when did when did you realize that the coalition forces were winning or the war was winding down? Did you have any sort of notion of that, or did, or, or you just kept on working? We just kept still... working. Yeah, I mean, we we'd heard it on the radio, and there was still a buildup of you know they didn't know how long that was going to last the ceasefire, and um, so the the plan was to to load up the log bases, move the ammo and all your you know, classes of supply forward. And did you uh, were, were you still throughout this whole process or this whole time period you're still carrying mostly ammo or did you carry uh, food or water or other, other. Yeah, it was it was a good mix of material. We had um, uh, a lot of a lot of rations we carried forward. Um, we, I remember this one truckload for some reason it was Perrier, just a truckload of Perrier that had to get forward. So, um, but a lot of barrier material, uh, construction material, um, wood, wire, um, that kind of stuff. Did you um, at any time as you're uh, there in country, did you come in, uh, in contact with any Iraqi prisoners of war? No, never did. We saw, um, I'm trying to, uh, Hafer al-Batin 
is a, a small town at the intersection of two what we call MSRs, main supply routes. One that was headed north into um, Iraq and one that was uh, the MSR Dodge or Tapline Road, which was the, the main uh, east-west. And right outside Hafer al Batin, they had a, a EPW site, enemy prisoner of war um, site. It was just, I just remember driving by it, and it wasn't like going by a federal prison where you got three sets of fences. I mean, it was just basically barbed wire stacked, you know, triple strand barbed wire um, or concertina wire that was stacked up, and these guys were just, you know, hundreds of them there but no I didn't I didn't have a personal uh, involvement in that how long did you remain in Saudi Arabia after the end of the war till July 26th 1991 and then what roles or duties did you perform as as a as or I guess well let me go back one step was there a transition time between supplying the troops for combat and then beginning cleanup or reestablishment? And what duties did you perform in that process? Um, we had a lot of retrograde um, duties. Um, and the retrograde was basically everything that we had moved forward needed to come back. So all the ammo, all the, all the rations, all the fuel, all the repair parts, all the equipment had to come back to the ports because we weren't going to maintain a presence in Saudi Arabia. So, And that took quite a while. Uh, was there so much stuff there because, or so much, so much equipment, so many weapons, so much ammunition, so much food uh, sent, sent in country because of the fear that, or the anticipation that the Iraqi army was more powerful than it was, more yeah. potent than what it was. Yeah, and I, I think they didn't know how long the ground war would be. Um, they were, you know, shocked when it was, you know, 100 hours, and that was it. But, I mean, you're always prepared. Um, looking back on your experience there for really what, since from November to July, you said, November 1990 to July of 1991, could you, do you think or could you uh, uh, assess the logistical system from your perspective as a lieutenant as successful? Can, can, can you say it was the logistics process, the, the supplying the troops with food and ammunition, from your perspective, do you think that the efforts were successful? And I guess, and, and I guess another way to define, define success, I mean, it was what it was, but... Uh, if it wasn't su successful, you would have known it, and there would have been a lot of complaints and so on, I, w I assume. So could you say it was successful? Oh, it was very successful. Um, from a, I guess from a Cold War doctrine, it really wasn't because the infrastructure wasn't there like you'd have in Germany or in, in Europe, you know, because that infrastructure's already been there. It's been there for, you know, 50, 60 years. This is a brand new place, and you're fighting a major battle, um, and you have to build the infrastructure from within. You know, 500,000 American soldiers and Marines on the yeah. ground. And it, it, it was uh, creative the way they um, met some of the challenges. Transporting personnel, you know, they use Saudi school buses, you know, which doctrinally we wouldn't have done. But you know you had to break doctrine to to meet the mission. So yeah, it was it was very successful, and it it kind of um, I think paved the way for um, you know the future uh, combat that that came later on. In terms of uh, you mentioned the uh, female major that was your uh, uh, your commanding officer uh, at the more advanced. A logistics base, the the, the uh, uh, intermediate station. Yeah, right. intermediate station. Yes, yes. Um, in terms of trying to solve some of these problems, did did she call staff conferences or conferences of the officers and you know uh, 
or seek out your opinions and try to work through some of these problems when she didn't necessarily have enough material or at the right place at the right time. She still needed to get things done. How did that, how did that problem solving process work? Um, basically, she told us what her um, requirements were. And then we had between, uh, I think there was two other captains, myself, and several NCOs. We had to meet those requirements. So, you know, she'd ask for input, and we'd say, here's how we think we can do it. And if she thought, you know, there was a better way or, you know, a different way to do it, then we'd, we'd listen. But basically, she she left it up to us. And that... and. Did that work? Was that the best way to handle things under the circumstances? Do you think? Um, I I think so. Just based on um, the the people that were there, um, and and the other two captains that she had there had worked with her in Fort Hood, so they knew um, how she operated, and that I think that made things a lot easier. Good. That that's sort of uh, problem solving. Or explanation of how problems were solved is, is is very useful to to those people who will be watching this this interview. Uh, <clears throat> by the time you left in July of 1991, had had you heard of something called Operation Provide Comfort, or had were, were you involved in that at all? No, no. All right, all right. So you leave leave the uh, uh, leave Saudi Arabia in July of 1991. Uh, do you fly home, or do you take a a, a surface a, a a a a ship home on the ocean, or how do you get back? Uh, we flew, and we flew. Uh, I believe it was the seven forty seven, and um, this goes against everything I ever believed in. But all the officers were up in first class, and the, the troops were back in coach. But uh, they go back and see them every now and then, and tell them how good we had it. Um, but <laughs> No, we flew back, um, and it was it was very memorable. Um, kind of an enjoyable flight, I would imagine. Yeah, it uh, it was tough leaving. It um, it was a place I I really never wanted to go back to, but it was you know I, I, I'd spent nine months there, and um, it um, I think made me a better person. Why? Um, even though we weren't engaged in combat, it was just the, the day in, day out um, activity and, and the closeness of, of with the troops, you know. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. So camaraderie, cohesion? Yep. Um, yeah, this term is you know, thrown around quite a bit, but band of brothers, or in your case, band of brothers and sisters. Right. Yep. Working for a common goal. Very good. Very good. So you uh, took the flight home. Uh, did you uh, did you fly into Topeka then? Or yeah, did we you flew into Philadelphia. And flew, oh, right. Yeah, and then changed planes. And I remember, um, and this was, you know, end of July. Um, we had missed the the July 4th parade we watched it on tv uh, downtown in uh, in in the mom and we got to watch it on tv so that was kind of neat but uh, we missed that and you know we thought well you know all the fanfare is over with we'll just come back and there were a lot of people um at philadelphia uh, that greeted us which i thought was really neat and then when we got to uh topeka uh, some of the um the maintenance um sergeants were in a uh, motorcycle club and we had a motorcycle escort from Topeka back to Fort Riley oh. which I thought was just neat and most of them uh, were Vietnam vets. Good. Good. Uh, so then you were on buses at that time? On buses, right. And then uh, so then you arrived at Fort Riley that 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 must have been a, a very satisfying and, and wonderful thing to arrive home. I understand. That's...
I always get choked up. Well, yeah, take your time. Oh, it's a great thing. It's, um, I got to see my son. Who was born a couple weeks into your yeah, deployment. Four days after we deployed. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, no. It was a it was a very great um, homecoming. Um, it still gets me. Yeah. But um, I was able to, you know, like I said, meet my son, uh, see my daughter, and uh, we were fortunate enough to bring home everybody we we took over we'd had some accidents but uh everybody uh made it and and they all came home so that was well, that was kind of a kind of a nice thing that's uh that qualifies as a successful operation then bringing everybody home yep um <coughs> How long did you stay in Fort Riley thereafter? Um, well. <coughs> we'll pick this up and see what happens with the phone. Okay. Got about 10 minutes to take. All right. Yeah, you? yeah, you sure can. Oh, man. Oh, good, she hung up. Okay. Ah. All right. How how much longer did you stay with uh, stay in Fort Riley thereafter? Um, I was there until about February of 1994. So I I'd spent quite a bit of time um, at Fort Riley. I became a battalion um, assistant S23 when I got back. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it's basically S2 is your security and intelligence within the battalion and the S3 is your your operations so uh, my old company commander uh, was the S3 so I was basically an assistant to him and then I went back to become the executive officer for uh, 24th trans for a little while um, and then I got deployed in 93 to Cuba for um, their anticipation of all the Haitians coming uh, ashore, and they needed a place to to keep them. And then um, was the S four logistics um, officer for the battalion up until the time I left. All right, this is still the the maintenance battalion. Right. Yep. Still the maintenance battalion. What was uh, what was uh, what was Cuba like? Uh, Gu Guantanamo Bay. I Guantanamo take it. Bay. Uh, what, was it, what that was that experience like? It was really small. It was. Uh, I just remember um, it's was, it was mainly Navy base, um, and they did have some aircraft, but that was on the other side of the bay. Um, we had, I don't know, a joint task force. Um, it was commanded by a uh, Marine Corps colonel, and we had Air Force majors and captains and Navy people, and Guantanamo was great. I mean, it was it was nice. It was tropical. It was warm. The water was great. You go snorkeling. I mean, it was like being back in Hawaii. And then, uh, what about the uh, uh, the the Haitian refugees? I take it that were getting on boats. Did you 
have interaction with them? No, not not mainly. Uh, they would uh, limit um, our exposure to them because a lot of those um, Haitians were um, HIV positive, so you have very limited uh, interface with them. Okay, so you you were at Fort Riley until you said 1994. 1994. And then by then, had you been promoted? Yes, I, I actually made first lieutenant while I was over in Saudi, um, and I got promoted. The promotion ceremony took place on what they called the love boat, which was a canard princess, which was in Bahrain. And uh, we had a weekend, uh, officer's weekend down there. And um, so I got promoted on, on deck of the ship, <laughs> which is good for a transporter. But uh, yeah, in, um, I believe it was August of 93, I, I made uh, captain. So Then uh, uh, following uh, 1990, where were, where were your subsequent uh, postings? Um, I went from Fort Riley to Fort Lee, Virginia for the uh, what they called Combined Logistics Officer Advance Course, and that was Transportation Ordinance and um, Quartermaster um, together. And then from there, I was uh, <laughs> I did a short tour, a one-year tour over in Kuwait. Um, where I worked uh, logistics um, for a year. Came back to Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri. Was there from 2005 until two, I'm sorry, from 95 till 2000. All right, I wanna, uh, going back to your uh, combined logis logistics officer school, is that what you called Advanced it? Advanced course, right. Advanced mm -hmm. course. Uh, was that, and, and the level of military education, was that, uh, would that be equivalent to going to uh, command a staff college for logisticians, or is it, where, it's, where does... It's lower, um, it's a lower education level. Basically, you have your officer basic course, which right. lieutenants go to. Right. And then you have um, your advanced course, which captains go to. They teach you how to become... Um, company commanders, uh, staff officers, and whatnot, plus advanced doctrine. In terms of that education, I mean, you had, you know, you had been there and done that in, uh, in the Persian Gulf. You had driven a truck. You had commanded units. You had worked creating a small city and been, you know, high enough in rank that you had responsibility, but low enough in rank that you also were actually working for a living. So uh, how did how was it going back to school after that and seeing what the classroom instructor might tell you should or shouldn't happen was was there you know this is this is going from practice to theory not theory to practice do you understand how was that did you did did you learn a lot did you were you able to uh, contribute a lot um, yeah and. I wasn't the only one. I mean, there were quite a few of my uh, my classmates that had been over there. So it was, we got the book learning, but we also threw in what we found out, you know, what worked, what didn't work. You know, yeah, this is good doctrine. However, it, it wouldn't work in the scenario we just came from. And um, so the instructors were very uh, open to that too. That's, uh, you know, one of the one of the theories I've had is that, you know, logisticians aren't really born, they need practice, and you gradually advance through more and more complex and larger and larger tasks. Right. And you can't, you know, there's another way to say it is there's no child prodigies in logistics. You've right. got to figure things out along the way and advance to more and more complex tasks. So you went to, and then you went back to Kuwait, and I think we will go to tape three for that. In the Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Mm, I may. Since we get online, I may ask you about that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, going back to uh, your 
uh, being stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, and that's in Missouri, did you Missouri. say? Missouri. Uh, what was your, uh, what was your uh, role there? What were your duties there? Um, this was my opportunity to lead a company, so I was company commander of uh, Bravo Company 58th Transportation Battalion, which was an AIT company. Um, it was a training, we were part of a training brigade. Um, Fort Leonard Wood had, uh, at the time, was uh, the engineer center, and they had one station unit training for a lot of engineer MOSs. Uh, but they also opened up the what they called the 88 Mike, which was the truck drivers. Um, and they did all the advanced individual training for the enlisted 88 Mike truck drivers at uh, Fort Leonard Wood. So I got to be one of two company commanders out there for uh, transportation. So was that rewarding? <laughs> two years worth, yes. Very, very rewarding. Um, I got to see... I don't know, I think we were on a five-week schedule for uh, AIT, five or six weeks. So uh, every couple weeks we'd get a new class and we'd have at least three classes going through. And I'd have 220, 225 soldiers at any one time uh, going through. Um, and I, I can see their faces, I can't always remember their names, but I can see their faces, you know, standing out there in formation. And um, it, it was really neat. To, to see the motivation level of these guys. I mean, you know, you're just going to be a truck driver, you know. But it's, it's more than that, you know. And you, you see them kind of come in from basic training, and they're um, not knowing what to expect because AIT is a different environment. And they're used to that, you know, the, the rigorous 24-7 um, routine, basically. But in AIT, you're learning a skill not just soldier skills, you're learning, you know, a, a marketable skill on the outside. So it was interesting to, to meet and um, interact with these, these soldiers. More so, um, it, w it was different than my soldiers in Desert Storm. I mean, because we had a mission, you know, to drive trucks then. This mission was to train these soldiers to drive trucks. So it was kind of a different different thing but it was still pretty neat very rewarding did you have occasion to apply some of the lessons that you had learned and some of the models that you had had with your superior officers in the past in this instance yeah uh, the army um, well, at least TRADOC with the training and doctrine command was undergoing some changes at that time they wanted to change some of their their training doctrine and I remembered back when I went through AIT at Fort Rucker um, how basically when we got off the bus in the afternoon, that time was ours to study, to d to do what we needed to do. Um, and I never had a drill sergeant in AIT. Well, there was drill sergeants at Fort Leonard Wood. And basically they regimented the lives of the, of the soldiers when they got off the bus. And I wanted to kind of go back to when I was in AIT where it was kind of hands off um, and my battalion commander was very supportive of that and we still had to operate within the, the regulations but we could kind of bend the regulations to make them soldiers and make them responsible soldiers because I always said you know you give a soldier enough rope to hang himself and they'll do it sometimes but if you treat them like adults, they'll act like adults. If you treat them like children, then that's normally what you end up getting. So we kind of, um, the battalion commander, myself, and one of the other company commanders kind of went to a different style where the first weekend um, they were allowed off post after they came from basic training. They were allowed off post, and then they had to come back. Well, we kind of extended some of the, the, the rules and stuff, but it was, it was interesting. I just wanted to make it where they came in, felt comfortable to learn, did what they needed to do, stayed out of trouble, and then, you know, graduated and, and went on. And so you were there for how many years? I uh, was company commander for two years. And then, you, but you stayed another three years at Fort Leonard Wood then? Yes. 
What was your uh, what was your what were your duties thereafter? Um, I went over, um, as my battalion commander would say, I went over to the dark side. Um, I left transportation. Uh, I went to the acquisition corps, um, and a lot of people don't know about the acquisition corps in the military. Acquisition corps basically is your research and development, your testing arm, your uh, manufacturing, and your uh, equipping of weapon systems, trucks, tanks, airplanes, uniforms, all this good stuff. Somebody needs to develop it. So this would this also be under procurement? Is that right? All right, another another name for or, right. uh, similar to procurement. Right. All right. And uh, what were your specific duties there? Um, I was a branch chief uh, at the engineer school for a weapon systems called the Wolverine. It was a, um, a armored bridge launcher to replace the armored vehicle launch bridge the Army's had. The, the issue with that, in a nutshell, is the old AVLB ran on an M60 chassis. Today's armor force is all M1s, which are faster, um, have different logistics requirements than the, than the M60. Um, so the, the engineer school was looking for a replacement to that uh, launcher. So they came out with one that had an M1 chassis and a German-developed bridge, and I was basically um, there to be a go-between between the engineer school and the combat developer, um, which was a TACOM, Tank and Automotive Command, in Detroit. So, oh, so was that a contractor that was working with, or was it... Our, was it were, were you working with contractors, or was it all internal to the military? It was uh, both. Both. Yeah, because there's a program office up in Detroit um, that managed the, the Wolverine program itself through General Dynamics, who were actually building it over in Lima, Ohio. And um, so I was kind of like the go-between between the engineer school to make sure all the user requirements, the engineers, had their user requirements translated into that, that equipment. And this was a uh, this was a device that basically allowed would allow you to bridge a creek or a gap, uh, right. a, a river or whatever. Right. Yep. So, uh, in terms of your previous experience on the transportation side and the maintenance side, were you able to take some of your practical lessons learned and observations and apply that in this job in any way? Um, not so much. Um, it it's um, it was very overwhelming at first. And they they always say, you know, you're drinking from the fire hose when you're learning these things. And and that's what it was. With um, there was no doctrine I could I could fall back on. You know, that would prepare me for uh, product development and research and development and test and it's all federal acquisition regulations and that is the basis of, of all the procurements so that was totally new to me and um, it was it was very it was a steep learning learning curve to, to get into that mindset you know the acquisition core so did you spend more uh, most or more of our most or more of your time uh, trying to apply or understand or, you know, uh, uh, be a watchdog for federal re regulations, or did you get into some of the technical specification side of it, or was it just all of the above? It was, it was to be done? mostly the technical specifications, right. making sure that what the engineers wanted in this vehicle got included into it, but also being mindful of uh, the regulations that govern um, the management of funds. You couldn't exceed what you're funded and you know so there was always that trade-off between requirements and dollars available to do that so you know when the program office said if we do this for you we have to cut this so how does that affect you and then I would have to go back to engineer school and, it was kind of a mediator kind of job at first, and then you get into more of the technical aspects of 
of it when it gets closer to fielding. So, so uh, as you're getting into the technical uh, technical aspe aspects, and you said as it's getting closer to the fielding, uh, were you involved in any of the tests of prototypes, uh, or were you assigned there long enough to get to the prototype stage? Oh yeah, um, definitely. We got to. Um, I had an NCO, a non-commissioned officer, an E7 that. Uh, I worked with, and he was a subject matter expert. He was actually an engineer soldier who drove the old AVLBs, so he was very familiar with the the requirements of that vehicle. Plus, he was familiar with the requirement documents for this Wolverine. So we would go to like Aberdeen, Maryland, for a live fire when they tested the bridge or they tested the chassis. And they would, I mean, they literally try to blow it up. And that's Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Aberdeen Proving Grounds, right. And uh, so we were involved in that. We were involved in um, testing out the manuals to make sure they made sense. Uh, we enlisted soldiers from Fort Knox to come up to Detroit for, I don't know, three months or something like that. They did a, a verification of the uh, tech manuals. So, I mean, there was uh, all kinds of different things we had to uh, be familiar with. So were you involved in this project? It sounds like from, all right, I guess let me go back to one. Were you involved in this project really from almost the beginning to almost the end? Were you there? To, were you able to see it through from an early stage to an ending stage? I got there probably towards the tail end because um, initially it, it's a lengthy process. Years, um, and, years, years and years. Years and years and years to, to get a weapon system from what they call cradle to, I mean, cradle to grave is, the the term in in acquisition yeah you um, you you develop a requirements document and then it has to be approved by a, a joint committee and then you have to get uh, appropriations funding and I mean it's it goes through Congress and I mean it's it's a lengthy lengthy process then the contract has to be let then you go into low rate um, initial production to to test out the manufacturing processes and then uh, does the vehicle hold up to what the user requirements are and I mean before you go into any kind of production you have to meet all these certain um, milestones. And then so you're at the tail end. That was at the, the tail, tail end, end where yeah. you actually could see a product. Right. It's not on the drawing board you can right. see a product and see it move right. and, and so on and see it be tested. Right. And then you were worked in that office for three years. Right. And uh, how far along in the Wolverine, whatever, procurement process, or I can't remember what, what, what term you use, but when did you leave? And, um, and uh, did you, were, were you able to see it almost to completion? Yes, we had conducted the um, briefing with the unit who was going to receive the first set of the Wolverines. And I left in... February and March of 2000, um, and in, I believe, January of 2000, it got killed. So that was, that was a very sad day, because uh, it was a, it, we were in low-rate initial production, and I think they'd built like 24 of these things, but the program got canceled, and as a lot of Army and Air Force, Marine Corps programs do. They get they get canceled. So it was it was kind of tough. So it's uh, 2000, and you moved on to another uh, another another station. Right. Where did you move from there? We um, packed up the family and moved to Warren, Michigan, to Tank and Automotive Command, um, and I was assigned as. Uh, assistant program manager for field of or family of medium tactical vehicles it was the uh, the deuce and a half and five ton replacement um, and the, the, they were being built by uh, S&S out of Sealy Texas and the program office was headquartered in Warren so I got to see from not the schoolhouse side of the requirements I got to actually see the production uh, side of the, of the vehicle, so, and I was a fielding um, APM. What does that mean? Um, when the 
trucks go into full rate production, uh, you have to work with headquarters Department of the Army who has the master fielding schedule. Like They determine what units need new equipment and when they get it and it's a whole lengthy process in itself. But once they determine like uh, Fort Hood um, gets, you know, this battalion gets X amount of five tons and deuce and a half, they're shipped to Fort Hood we have a contract with a um, fielding uh, or a processing unit company and they go out and they deprocess these vehicles, get them ready to issue to the soldiers. So I was in charge of worldwide fielding of the vehicles to, to Army units. So not only the production bringing them off the line at the factory, but then also getting them into the hands, right. so that'd be more administrative or bureaucratic aspect of right. it. Inventory lists and uh, time schedules. Right, and, 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 you, and, right. and there were um, pre-conferences with the, uh, the post uh, or, you know, the fort, uh, like Fort Hood. We'd work with the, the G4, the general staff, the logistics, to work out when they would arrive, where they would be, how the handoff would take place, you know, and what, what they needed to provide to us to make that successful. Was that, a, was that a rewarding experience? It was probably the most time I spent away from home. Um, and I did that from, like I said, March of 2000 until probably June of 2002. And... Um, so lots of traveling. Although. Lots of traveling, lots of um, pressure to meet schedule. Uh, schedule was just, because you don't waste soldiers' time. That's, that's the big thing. Every, every division commander that was getting fielded new vehicles, don't waste a soldier's time. Come in, hand them off, give them training, you know, give them what they need, and then, you know, get out. Um, along the way, did you have interaction with, uh, well, you say division commanders, did you have interaction with uh, uh, division commanders, major generals, or assistant commanders, or other high-ranking officers? Sure. Almost every post we went to, we give uh, a new material briefing to uh, the division commander, their G4. Um, I met General Odenero, who's over in Iraq right now, when he was uh, fourth ID down in uh, Fort Hood. But, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and um, they um, they knew what to expect for fieldings, and they there were um, program managers who they really didn't want to deal with because they'd heard they did drive-by fieldings where they just left the equipment and didn't really do what they were supposed to do. But yeah, yeah. we were we were held to the task. That's pretty pretty heady stuff for what a captain or were you a major by the I was a major. Major still a major, major, you know, floating around with, you know, BGs and MGs. Yeah. Uh that's pretty heady stuff. Yeah. My my boss was a an O six full bird colonel and um we flew many miles together and as a matter of fact, uh one of the down points was it was such a hectic uh pace that um I had a heart attack in two thousand one. And um, it was uh, beginning of February. I was up at shopping at Meyer with my son, and uh, I just fell over dead, basically, in the parking lot. So it was stress related to that. Plus, I was a that was the other thing I didn't mention. But when I was in basic training, I picked up a bad habit of smoking because the guys who smoked got more breaks than the guys who didn't so <laughs> but you know and I continued that through my my military career so that with the stress kind of just made me prone to falling over but I'm better now so what was your um, what did did um did the uh, attack on 9/11 affect your schedule or your career or your you're in any way? Um, no, not, not really. Um, I, I remember it, but um, we were 
and actually we were having a staff meeting when the first things came out but um, I, I think we all knew we would have to um, ramp up some production to, to meet different schedules but we were used to change so you know it was kind of you said you were there what through 2002 right and uh, that was before the that would have been before the big push for invading Iraq right yeah. but you would have been ramping up with the deployments to Afghanistan, Afghanistan the invasion right. and the deployments yeah. to Afghanistan right was there any anticipation as you were in 2002 that there might be another you know uh, you know another uh, need to expand to meet uh, to to meet the threat from Iraq or was that um was that in people in, in the back of people's minds? I think minds? it was in the back of people's minds that, that it might time. happen. Right. Yep. yep. So it's two thousand two, where to and you're you retired in two thousand six. Right. Um two thousand two um I I stayed at TACOM in Warren. I went over to uh, the um research and development side. Um, and I worked at Tardec, which is Tank Automotive Research Development Engineering Center. And I got to work on um, some special projects, um, some robotics projects, and uh, some uh, up-armored vehicle projects and stuff like that. What does up-armor mean? Um, your, uh, what do they call them? The, um, like your Chevy Suburbans that you know the armor plating for like state department vehicles or um vip vehicles and so this this was now research and development well you seem to have moved through just about every stage you know the the operating of the vehicles and acquisitions and and then production and now research research and development did do you was this uh uh an intentional thing throughout your career that this that you evolved this way or did it just kind of happen and no, it just happened just yeah, kind just, of happened yeah. but by the time you get to research and development having seen all these other stages did that did that enable you to do, perform your duties better yes. because you understood I mean basically all the other stages in the process right yeah and it, I was able to put the puzzle together a little better at that time I wished I had done it in a different order that it might have made more sense at the beginning, but it, it kind of all fell into place, and especially after I left Tardec and then um, in 2003 um, moved down to uh, back to Van Wert and uh, was at the tank plant working for uh, Defense Contract Management Agency, and I got to be what they call a PI, and it's not private investigator, it's program integrator, that I worked between the program office in Detroit once again, and this time the actual um, contractor who's building the tanks. So I got to do that for three years with the M1A1. And that, and that was similar to, to other, another the position you had held earlier. Yeah. In terms of interfacing right. and, and being a mediator kind of. Mediator. Well, we're coming towards the end of, of the interview, and I just have a couple more questions uh, for you. Um, what achievement or credential or mm, award are you most proud of after having served for about 20 years and, you know, as, a, as a enlisted and then as an officer? Is there something that you're most proud of? Um... Yeah, I would say it's probably my good conduct medal I got when I was enlisted. Because that was uh, back in 83 through 86. It was probably easier to do the wrong thing, being in Hawaii, being single as much of the time as I was, and, you know, just being young and, and getting into trouble but I think learning to be a soldier and, and getting 
a dose of discipline, I think that helped me out immensely. And, and going out of the Army with a good record, you know, being able to qualify to, to get the good conduct medal, that, that's, that's the one that really kind of stands out. And in your career, you served with uh, a variety of units and a variety of 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 of, of uh, stations and so on. Uh, where does service with the First Infantry Division kind of fit in that? Um, I'd have to say that was the best of times. Um, that was probably uh, the most fun I had um, because it was you were kind of given. Uh, and I don't want this to sound bad, but as a lieutenant, they don't expect you to be perfect. That's why you're a lieutenant. They, you're, you're supposed to screw up. You're supposed to learn. And, and the only way you learn is by, you know, hands-on, doing things, getting in with the, with the troops and, you know, getting your, your hands dirty. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it goes back to the cohesiveness and the bonding and, and, and the the band of brothers kind of thing it was just i i just remember more of those day-to-day uh, -day, uh interactions uh with the troops um and i mean it was you know it was wartime but i mean we we got to do our mission on a daily basis you know we got to drive trucks we got to move uh, equipment we we made an impact you know on on the, on the war you know, supporting the war. So, and of course, when you went to and so the production and research and development, you're not really interacting with the troops anymore. You're no. you may be you know on during tests, but not on a day to day day level where right. you seem to enjoy and get a lot out of building in guys' lives and and working with them. And that's something that you, as interesting as would have been to you know be at tank tests and so right. on, you're not interacting with the troops like that. Right. Well, is there anything else that you want to say as your sort of closing statement? This is your open forum. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I don't think I would have changed anything. Um, you know, I, I think, and it's just my personal opinion, is, you know, that it, that it should be a requirement for officers to do at least two years enlisted. Um, however... You know, I don't think that'll ever happen. But you know, to 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 trust your soldiers to to actually understand what they've gone through, um, it makes a it makes a big difference. You know, and and I mean, yeah, you're still gonna be out there to accomplish the mission, but you can understand wh why they do the things they do. Um, but you know, and and as far as being a logistician, I would. <laughs> I don't think I would have been anything else. Um, I just remember um, General Schwarzkopf giving his overview brief of the uh, of the war, and that was one of the things he came out and said. He says, "I can't thank the logisticians and truck drivers enough, transporters enough." You know, I mean, it made me feel good when he said that because you know, yeah, it's the guys on the ground in the tanks and in the in the Bradleys that won the war on the ground but you know it's the guys behind those guys pushing the stuff forward I think that uh, can make or break you and I was proud to be part of that. Well very good. On uh, behalf of uh, Ball State University and the Cantini First Division Foundation I want to thank you for your service and for your willingness to do this interview. Well thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>